help promote energy efficiency, water conservation, recycling, and sort of the environmental lights of sustainability. And then this new initiative, which is all about a more broader look at how Edmondson can be a more livable, sustainable community and getting recognition for the great things that we're already doing. So do you want to start off and just give your kind of name and name? Sure. Uh, my name is Brian Atkins. I live here in Edmondson, and I'm interested in uh, complexity and coding structures, C-O-D-I-N-G, and I, my argument is, is that our current cultural coding structures are complexity inadequate, increasingly so. My website is postgenetic.com. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dave Van Boren with the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County. Cameron Hurley, the same. Dorothy Head, I'm with uh, Evanston Neighbors United, a grassroots group that started in 2011. Environmental justice issues. Okay. I'm Linda Beck, and I'm with the uh, United United as well. Okay. I'm sitting in the head, and I'm also with the United. Okay. My name is Ethan Caldwell with the U.S. Center for Student Engagement, Northwest University. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Miguel Sanchez, and I'm uh, interning for Catherine, working on Star. Okay, so Anderson, hopefully you're going ahead and taping. So welcome, this is um, our, one of our first community presentations on the STAR Communities Project. So happy that you could all be here. The intention is to give you a little bit of an overview about STAR Communities, what our process has been to date, and how you all can help us to cross the finish line and get recognized for all the wonderful things that the Evanston community is doing to be a sustainable community. So I, um, in this handout, so I'll go through the slides and we'll try to leave questions for the end so that we can get through the content, but then please jot down or make notes of things you want to ask about and we'll have plenty of time at the end. So the path to sustainability is different for every community because every community is different. Some places in the country don't have enough water and other places are having deluge of rainfall and lots of rivers and streams that are overflowing. Some communities um, you know, are seeing differences in temperature where other places there's you know, cold changes and crops are having a hard time growing. So while communities are different and the ways that we get to a sustainable community may be different, we all have the basic same goals. We're looking to have a healthy environment, a strong local economy, and well-being for the people in our community. And in the broad, broadest definition of sustainability, when we work to invest and set goals and progress in all three of these areas together, that's what we mean by being a sustainable, livable community. It's not only caring about the environment, which is important, but it's also making sure that we have jobs and the ability for people to, leave, to live within the community in a means that is reasonable, and also to make sure that there are services and education and access to arts and outdoor spaces and a really large breadth of things. So this whole Star Communities project is about looking at a, the most broad perspective of the community and seeing how we're doing. So the STAR Communities Rating System is the first national framework to evaluate at the community level what communities are doing to address all three of those components I mentioned, the people, um, the economy, and the planet. And measuring based on national benchmarks for both measurable outcomes and for actions to see how you're doing, how do you measure up. Because it's very easy to often say that we're doing many great things. People want to know, well, how, can you, how do you measure up? are you doing in more specific categories? And so this is all about getting to that next level of specificity. So the STAR Communities Program was built by and for local governments. So this isn't a um, for-profit company that's come in and said, okay, communities, this is something that you should do. This is actually developed by dozens and dozens of volunteers and members from out communities all across the country with several leading organizations that were involved in the development of it, including the U.S. Green Building Council, which has been very involved in the LEED building rating system, which is sort of a similar way of thinking about STAR communities, but at the community-wide level. There are also lots of volunteers from not only those expert organizations, but individual communities across the country, technical experts who were very knowledgeable in the individual content areas and helped to bring their best practices and knowledge from their specific industry together. There are also nonprofit organizations, um, private corporations, you know, utilities, both energy and water, gas. So really a large number of people come into the table together to create one system so that there wouldn't be multiple systems all sponsored by different organizations. And I should also say this is a multiple year process. So 
from the early phases of wouldn't it be nice if we had one way of measuring the sustainability of a community at the biggest, broadest picture, to then getting to all the details, which took many years to develop. So this map shows you um, at a national scale both the pilot communities. So right now there's 30 communities, um, Evanston is one of them, that are going through the rating system for the first time. They're calling it a pilot because throughout the process, Evanston and the other communities have been able to give valuable feedback on how the rating system um, was for their community. If there were things that people thought were um, confusing or too hard or too easy, so that the idea is that this, the rating system before it was finally vetted, the last step was to have communities participating. Mm -hmm. So you can see the yellow star on underneath the dot that represents Evanston. We're the only community in Illinois going through the pilot. There were some communities um, that, that aren't shown on here that were part of a beta. They were actually involved before the rating system was fully done on some of the specific components, and the city of Chicago was one of those. But we're the only pilot community in Evanston, so we'll be one of the first 30 communities to be rated. And then the new green dots on this map represent other communities that have said, you know, we're interested in STAR as well, and they're starting to participate in the process. For 2014, STAR Communities is rolling out a new leadership communities program that'll take another set of 25 to 30 communities to help them through a year-long process of using the rating system to get a rating similar to the pilot. The idea is that you can use the rating system and, and apply the online tools on your own, but having the support and guidance from the STAR community staff and interpreting the information that kind of one-on-one -on -one would be helpful. So those green ones are um, the participating communities. And I would propose that in five years from now, every major community that um, it has a goal of, of having broad-based community sustainability is either using the framework in their regular planning and processes or going through the process of being graded through STAR communities. So we're going to see lots more dots on this map in the future. This then breaks down the actual names of the communities divided up by the size. So you can see there's both communities under 100,000, like Evanston, as well as communities up to over a million, and everything in between. There's communities that you would consider to be national leaders in sustainability, like Seattle and Portland, as, as well as other communities that are using this as a great way to benchmark what they're currently working on, and then have a plan moving forward for continuous progress. Like I said before, it's a rating system, not a ranking system. So the idea is to accumulate points for the outcomes and actions that you're doing and then based on the number of points you achieve to get a certain recognition level. So if you're just interested in looking at the online tools and you want to um, incorporate some of those practices, you can be a participating community and that's the entry level. And then all the way up to a five star being the maximum number of points you could achieve um, for all the different things across all the sectors. And as we can, we'll see in a few minutes, individual points, there are lots of different things you can do to achieve points. And so 400 points is the four star community level, which is what Evanston is working to achieve. And each one of those points is hard earned. In fact, there's some neat things that Evanston's doing that maybe is worth a half a point. And you say, wow, that's a really great thing that we're doing it. It's only worth a half a point. But when you collect all the things the whole community is doing, that's what's going to get us the four star rating and the full comprehensive sustainability practices. So to get a little bit more definition about what do we mean by a sustainable community, there's actually seven areas that STAR focuses on and provides up a community into. Um, and so this first slide shows you the first four. So the built environment to achieve livability, choice, and access for all people where they live, work, and play. So it's pretty comprehensive. This includes buildings, it includes public transit, um, infill and redevelopment. Climate and energy, to reduce climate impacts through adaptation and mitigation efforts and to increase resource efficiency. So this is where your waste minimization comes in, energy efficiency of buildings. This also looks at if we know that there are changes already happening to our climate, what are the things we can do to be more prepared? So on the prepared side, is there a way we can have more cooling centers for people that don't have air conditioning so when it gets really hot they have somewhere to go? Is there a way through code or through other efficiency retrofits of buildings that we can actually make our buildings um, more resistant from you know, heat escaping or cold getting in in the winter and the summer? So if we know that changes are already happening, what can we do? And that's what we call mitigation. Economy and jobs is, is very important to start as well. So to create equitably shared prosperity and access to quality jobs. And there's a large focus on quality jobs in your own community. Because if you think about it, if you don't have to travel as far for your job, 
that then reduces the amount of vehicle emissions, the amount of resources needed, so there's a focus on um, local jobs. Education, arts, and community to empower vibrant, educated, connected, and diverse communities. And there's lots of different things in here, including um, graduation rates and education from both you know, pre-K all the way to high school, as well as engagement in cultural arts and historic preservation. Equity, equity and empowerment to ensure equity, inclusion, and access to opportunities for all citizens. And there's some interesting things there, including voter registration, access to community resources, um, and lots of interesting things as well. The environmental justice is in that category as well. Health and safety, to strengthen communities to be healthy, resilient, and safe places for residents and businesses. So this includes components around having physical activity and having a low um, rate of, of sickness and disease in the community, as well as um, you know the rating that our police and fire department have and making sure that we can respond to emergencies. And then finally, natural systems, to protect and restore the natural resource base upon which life depends. So when you combine all of those seven things together, and are working hopefully equally in all of those things, that broad picture then defines um, in this program what a sustainable community is. So really, I think we'd be hard pressed to come up with something that we're doing somewhere in the community that can't fall into one of these seven things. So it's really pretty broad. So the rating system itself, the topmost tier are the goal areas. So those are the major themes that I mentioned, those seven ones we just discussed. And then under each of the goal areas, there are then multiple objectives. So the more concrete, clear, desired outcomes that we're intending for communities to work to achieve. And then underneath those objectives, there's outcome measures. So measuring specifically the number of people that attend cultural arts events a year, the graduation rates of your post-secondary school, as well as action measures. And those action measures are really the best practices that all those national experts identified really need to be achieved in order for a community to be sustainable. So then when you put all of this together, I like this, this is sort of the main matrix of the STAR Communities Rating System. So across the top it has all the goal areas, and then down the columns, each one of those boxes represents one of the objectives. Overall there are 44 individual objectives. Each objective has anywhere from one to four measurable outcomes, and eight to 12 best practices that you can report on. So I wanted to go into a little bit more detail to give you, illustrate some examples of what the um, outcomes and measures uh, really look like. And what I've done is I've picked a couple different objectives that might be things that automatically don't come to, my, to mind when you're talking about a, a sustainable community. If the initial premise had been we're just talking about the environment, about recycling and energy, I've picked ones that are very different from that to talk about in a little bit more detail. So under economy and jobs, and you can see Everything is coded a little bit, so some of the people that are really ingrained in this will say, okay, well in EJ1, which is the Business Retention and Development category, so economy and jobs, um, the purpose of this um, objective is to foster economic prosperity and stability by retaining and expanding businesses with support from the business community, which makes sense. We want to make sure that if we're going to have a thriving economy that we are able to retain and expand businesses. So under this Objective then, they're measuring, uh, there's three specific outcomes that I want to me measure. So an increase the number of businesses established over time. And you can see option one is around the county data and option two is around the municipal data. One of the things that STAR strives for is to, wherever possible, use existing databases and data sets to make it easy for communities to look up the information. So if data is available based on at the county level, then you can report county level data. Many communities are sophisticated enough and have are doing work in tracking their own business retention and expansion, so you could also use municipal data. So throughout the process, there are some places where the only option is really county data. In some cases, we can choose. Outcome two is about annual sales. So not only do we want to retain those businesses and get new businesses, we want to make sure that those businesses are growing and that they are continuing to increase their sales. And then number three is employment, to make sure to increase the percentages of residents employed over time. So we want to make sure we have businesses in the community that are growing and expanding and thriving. We want to make sure that they're employing people that live in the community. Um, and so demonstrating an increase in the percentage of residents employed or decreasing the unemployment rate of residents. So in economy jobs, business retention development, these are the things that we're setting out to, to collect. 
I didn't have on this slide, because it take up many slides, that in addition to the outcomes, there are a whole um, list of the actions, the best practices that you can um, implement. And in the STAR community grading system packet, there's a whole sheet after the outcomes that lists all the different actions. So there are um, lots of different things that then the community can work. And the theory really is that um, in order to reach these measurable outcomes, you actually need to be doing a lot of those actions. So the way that the point process works is you can get the majority of the points if you can achieve the measurable results in these outcome areas. Because the thinking is that you'd actually have to be doing all those actions anyway. In many cases when the um, data that we need to provide is either hard to get or doesn't quite show the trend that we want, you can just simply report on all the actions that you're doing and you get you know, a good amount of credit for the actions, but you couldn't get the full point value if you weren't doing basically actions and outcomes. So this is a good example of um, business retention development in economy and jobs. So another area that sometimes is often thought to be a, a nice luxury in a community, but not an essential service, is arts and culture. And through Star Communities, it's very apparent that um, education, arts, and culture and community are very important. And so arts and culture are the objective number one, to provide a broad range of arts and cultural resources and activities that encourage participation and creative self-expression. And there's two specific things that um, this objective is looking to measure that creative industries represent at least a 5% share of all business in the county. And I think this is interesting because this kind of connects the part that we need to have, there needs to be not only art and culture in the community, but that also can be an economic engine. So we find this one is related to the economic activity of the arts in the arts section, but it's referencing things that are also related to um, the economy. So that's um, really great. And creative industries like to be all sorts of different things related. Um, to any of the visual, performing, cultural arts. And then the second one's really interesting, attendance and participation, um, demonstrating that 50% uh, of adult residents in the county attend a live performing art event annually, or 30% of the adult residents in the county visit an art museum annually. So we want to make sure that these things are available and that people are actually using them and taking advantage of them. This is definitely an area where having data available at the county level, there are arts, organizations and um, databases available, but one could um, definitely argue that in Evanston we might have people that are a lot more engaged in these types of activities than is average for the county. So over time, in terms of continuous improvement, the STAR Communities Program will continue to evolve and if we're able to have a way of measuring this data for Evanston residents or at the community level, we may be able to over time see distinguish ourselves from other communities in the Cook County area if we believe that we're doing more of this. So this is an example where right now we have to use county data, but over time if we can create systems to collect data at our more local level, we may be able to apply for that in the future. Another um, area that I want to call out under um, equity and empowerment, the objective number six, the poverty prevention and alleviation. So to prevent people from falling into poverty and proactively enable those who are living in poverty to obtain greater lasting economic stability and security. So there's two specific outcomes measuring here. Progress towards a reduction of no residents living below the poverty line by 2025 and demonstrate a decrease over time in the percentage of residents living below the poverty line. So this also goes to highlight that all the different things that we're doing in the community, they're all important, and we need to make sure that we're addressing the needs of all the people in the community. Um, and you know, in the previous slide, talking about arts um, and culture, it's great if we have people that are attending events, or we've got other people that are having a difficulty just meeting their basic living needs, we need to be addressing both of those things. And so they're both called out and provide opportunity for points. And in both of these as well, there's a whole list, you can look in the packet or online, of the actions um, that are associated with the different things to achieve points in this area. And then uh, lastly, safe communities. So this is another area sometimes that might not be normally included in a discussion about sustainability, but we need to have a safe community. We can have lots of resources and be really energy efficient and have access to arts and education, but if it's not a safe place for people to work, live, and play, then we're not being very holistic in our context of sustainability. So to pre prevent and reduce violent crime and increase perceptions of safety through the interagency collaboration with residents as empowered partners. And residents, um, the members of the community, and the people who, who visit and who um, come to the community, those are all really important components. While the, the city is representing 
the collection of the information for star communities. It's really all about the people and how they interact with one another and with all the services and organizations. So there's two different um, outcomes, violent crime rate, and there's the statistics shown there, as well as school violence. And so we're obviously going to be working with the police department and the schools to collect data um, in these areas to make sure that, um, see what we can report on, and then there's lots of different actions um, in safe communities as well. So there are 44 individual objectives. So we did four kind of examples of the 44. So they're very um, comprehensive, and then they're all actions associated with each one that are best practices that, in theory, would help you to achieve the outcomes. It would be hard to achieve all these outcomes and not be doing all the best practices. But you have the opportunity in the system to get points for either one or both. So we're collecting all sorts of data. And all the data right now we're collecting in spreadsheet form so that we can have a repository of it here before we go ahead and submit it. But the actual STAR Communities reporting tool is a really neat online um, interactive database. So this is an example there. Just like there are seven goal areas, there are um, seven different main areas within STAR on the online tool. So this is an example of climate and energy. And under climate and energy, one of the objectives is called greening the energy supply. And so below you can see there's a blue button for outcomes, which is clicked in, and then the two options for outcomes come up, the green vehicles and electrical energy supply. And so you check the different boxes that you're interested in reporting on, and then it opens up the specific data fields where you actually have to put in the details. With all of these things, you have to provide uh, verifiable information that provides the resource that you know, explains what they're asking for. You could also click the next button called Actions, and then this is a screenshot showing an example of the litany of actions. So this is from built environment number seven, which is transportation choices. So these are the different kinds of actions that STAR is suggesting that communities focus on. So the first one, adopt a bicycle and pedestrian master plan and or non-motorized safety plan that prioritizes future projects to improve access to non-motorized transportation and increase safety. So this is an example of one of the actions. Right now, the city of Edmondson is working on updating our bicycle master plan. So one of the things that um, when you check this and you hit enter response, another field comes up and it asks you to provide a link to your latest copy of your plan or safety plan. It asks you to describe how community members were involved in the development of it. It asks you to describe um, one of the most compelling reasons why it meets the requirements of improved access to non-motorized transportation. So when, after the community hits the submit button, then the STAR community's verification team will go in and every link that we provide, every write-up that we write, every spreadsheet we upload, someone will be looking at that to make sure that we've submitted what's required. So you can see there are 10 examples on here. Um, this sample screenshot, not everyone is checked because there are some things that, um, for this community, you know, particular perspective weren't able to be achieved. So number six, increase the percentage of households with access to transit. If you have a community that has a pretty established transit system and you haven't had any expansion of bus lines, you don't have any expansion of your rail line, you might have good access to transit, but you're not, haven't done any improvement of transit access over time. So a lot of the um, actions are all about increasing or improving on the positive side or decreasing things that we don't want to do. So it's all about continuously improving. If we were to then go back three or four years from now, what we did previously in improving access to transit was good, but in order to continue to get credit for increasing access to transit, we have to make the case of how we're continuing to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's really the, the um, star rating that you're gonna get is a sort of a snapshot of time, but to continue to be at that level, we have to continue to improve. And that's one of the great things about the system is that it's encouraging and setting helping set goals for continuous improvement. So that's a little bit of the overview about the actual tool. And when we finish, I'll, we can get into lots of questions and we can talk about some of the specific work that you are doing and how we can um, engage you and your, your information. But just a little bit about our timeline. So phase one of our approach was to do the high level review of every outcome and every action and all 44 objectives and really figure out what is the Evanston community doing and where do we think we can achieve recognition? So we had some interns over the summer that were wonderful and they went on the website, they talked to staff, they sort of did the initial, what could we find that is pretty obvious in terms of actions and outcomes. And then we had goal area meetings with all the departments 
interdepartmentally talking about each goal area and the various actions and outcomes and what work they were doing or what work they know about in the community that has, is going on that we might be able to use to receive recognition. We also, as you can imagine, set up you know, organization on our server and got spreadsheets and all sorts of tracking going to make sure that we could keep track of all the things that we were doing. And by the end of the summer, what we really had was a road map for all the different actions and outcomes that we were going to pursue and an identification of the detailed data that we needed to collect. And by the end of that process, um, our goal then was to go for the four star rating. As you can imagine, because each of those actions that we saw on the previous slide, many of them were just worth one point, some are worth two points, it depends on the type of action. So a policy or um, a specific law might give more points because you're ensuring that it's going to be happening, whereas some of the education outreach might have a lower point value. And in the beginning of the start packet, it sort of talks about how different actions have different point values. So we went through the whole process and believe that we are doing a lot of great things and want to make sure that we can get every detail so we can shoot for the four star rating. So then phase two, which is what we're doing right now, is the detailed data collection. For each action and outcome, there are a number of a couple paragraphs of a write-up and number of participants that were involved in the program and how much it cost to spreadsheets and backup data. So right now we're working with Miguel as one of my interns, I have several others, to go back then to all the departments and then all the community groups that were identified that are doing great work in these areas to work with them to collect the information so that we can get it into the tool. We've right now identified at least 50 different organizations and community partners that are doing work that's really important to report and as we continue to have discussions we identify new ones every day so the next several months is all about working with myself the other staff and the interns to follow up all that great stuff that's being done and make sure that we're collecting it in a way that can be put into the spreadsheets for the tool this is really just the first of um, lots of community outreach um, that we're going to be doing and really um, because we need to work with lots of groups to start collecting information, I wanted to at least make sure we had a community meeting to anyone who wanted to come to hear about it. We're taping the presentation today so we can put it on the website so anyone who was not able to join can watch it and download the slides. And we'll be doing lots of follow-up um, throughout this month and throughout next month to work one-on-one -on -one with individuals and organizations that are doing lots of great work that we want to incorporate into the process. And then in addition, I should also say, um, before I leave off on that, that there are so many wonderful things going on in the community that there are continuously new things that have not been covered yet that we're doing that we want to report as well. So it's kind of a, a continuous improvement or data collection fact-finding process where someone mentions a new program, oh, I didn't realize we were doing that, where can that fit in STAR, and then following up with that person or that group and getting the information put in. So really, until we hit the submit button, we can still continue to add new things um, and make sure that we're capturing and incorporating as many of the wonderful things that we're doing in the community. Um, phase three, once we have everything in that spreadsheet form so that we, we have it, we, we make sure we can wordsmith it. If people want to have a, a view of what how we're going to portray their program, we can do that. Then that last phase really is just to copy and paste all the information from our spreadsheets into the online tool. That way we don't get confused of what's already in there, we don't really start that process until pretty much everything is done, and we can always go back to that spreadsheet where we saved it originally. Um, our ambitious goal was to try to get everything done before the end of the year. As part of the pilot, we are contractually obligated to hit, hit the submit button by the end of March of next year, so we actually have some extra time in the schedule especially if we end up uncovering lots of extra programs and additional partners that we want to incorporate. But if we feel that we have collected everything that was identified by the end of the year, it would be really great to um, go off you know, for the new year and have hit the submit button. And that will also um, allow us to get a rating sooner. It's going to take between 30 and 60 days um, from the time we submit it when we're going to receive the feedback. So they're going to go and um, verify all the information that we submitted. There's you know, definitely could be cases where we thought we had a program that really met the requirements and we submitted the information and upon someone else independently looking at it, they said, you know, I see this is a great program, but it didn't really meet the intention um, of what you said. And I would much, much more rather err on the side of submitting things that we think are pretty good fit and, and not um, excluding things for the sake of being overly conservative. So we could get back less points that we think we're going to get because we've submitted on anything and, and everything that we thought was appropriate. 
So hopefully, depending on when we submit, sometime in the early first quarter or getting a second quarter, we could get the, our community rating. And then really the feedback on, yes, this is um, recognition of the things that you're doing and then identifying the things that we didn't achieve points for that we want to start working on. So in terms of our current data collection process, this is where we definitely need help from individuals and community organizations. We have some existing data needs and some of the folks may be here because we had sent some emails um, to some specific organizations we know have programs that have already been identified as would get us points for STAR. We also have, like I said, lots of opportunity for new suggestions, programs, and things that we um, have been suggested later in the phase. We want to capture those as well. Anybody that takes home a packet or that reads information online and has an idea and wants to make sure that this program is getting included, you can send those. Um, sustainability at City of Evanston is accessible to myself and all my interns, so we can send emails to there. And then at the end, once we're really ready to start copying and pasting online, I'll have interns, but there's also opportunity for community members to come and do a, a crowdsourcing. We can um, copy and paste information into the tool because since there's hun literally hundreds of, of different things to, to upload, there'll be lots of opportunity to share um, the task of uploading information. So we'll talk about, you know, from you folks in the room once we get done with this, how this will pan out in more detail. There's lots of opportunity to get involved. So this is a little bit, um, might be hard for you to read, but this is just another screenshot of that um, matrix and just to give you guys a perspective of how it breaks down um, at the bottom I have the total number of points and the total number of points I think we're, we're trying to pursue although this is continually in flux as I said we have new ideas and opportunities coming forth all the time so it's a little bit of a, um, a variable but most of the categories are worth 100 points so all of them except for education arts and community and then below that we have the percentage and the number of points we think we're going to be trying to pursue. So built environment, maybe 60, 67, you know, 70%, somewhere around there. Climate and energy, maybe 60, 65%. Education, arts, and community, that I think we're doing really well in this area, 87%. Historic preservation is a huge strength for Evanston. We have a full-time historic preservation coordinator. We have many historic preservation districts and have a long record of doing work in historic preservation. So there's lots of points there. Maybe in the 60 to 70% for economy and jobs. Equity and empowerment, this is actually an area where um, I'm glad the folks from um, Evanston, Evanston Neighbors United um, are here because environmental justice is an area that right now we had not assigned a lot of points and I think the work that you guys have been doing um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but I think this is actually on, on a, a low estimate, so hopefully we can be more in the 60, 65 um, points. Health and safety around 75, and then natural systems maybe in the 40 to 50. Natural systems has a whole objective called working lands, which is all about sustainably harvesting raw materials that can be turned into finished products in a sustainable way, and Evanston is a very um, built out community. Even the, the community gardens and the local food things we're doing can count in food access and nutrition, but we really don't have any working lands under the definition of star community. So communities that are more rural will be able to get credit for the sustainable harvest that they're doing in that category, but having one whole objective that we're not able to go for decreases the amount of really potential points in that area. There's also innovation points you can get for either exceeding one of the objectives or um, doing other process improvements that are, are deemed to be innovative and helping to really advance the um, field of community sustainability. And so we'll also be working right now, the citizen engagement um, and education outreach work that the city has been doing is really great. Um, I think the um, aging in place and the stuff that the Levy Center, Christina Ferraro are doing, is, is doing, and all the other community partners is another area where we can um, apply for some extra points. So we'll be pursuing that as well. But our initial assessment, I believe we're going to be well over the 400 point threshold which is needed for the four star, which is really, really exciting. So just a few final sort of program insights. As I mentioned before, and we, we highlighted a little bit, STAR really does integrate the environment, the society, and the economy all throughout the whole program. So we don't just have one pillar called economy and one pillar called environment. There's components related to the economy and the environment and jobs and people all spread throughout the process is really great because it sort of shows us that when we focus on just one bucket, we might be leaving out all these other adjacencies that um, are very helpful and help support one another. So really, um, 
Uh, they say all, all are welcome. This is a very uh, encompassing and inclusive um, process and program, and really all the things that we're doing across the community are needed in order to really meet the definition of sustainability. The interns and the volunteers I've had so far have been wonderful, Miguel and a litany of others, and those folks are very, very important to help follow through with um, initially where what areas we need to collect data on, all the data collection now, and um, to do that in a really cost-effective way because um, most of them are volunteering their time. So there'll be lots more follow-ups and interns. And at the end of the, the, the process, we're going to have a community-level sustainability rating that will give us recognition for at a national level compared to best practices, how we're really doing, how we compare, and also help us identify the areas of improvement. Because there are going to be some things that maybe there's some things that we know about and some things that we, wow, that's an interesting area. I didn't, we haven't really thought about it in that perspective. So we're going to both get a good scorecard of the things that we're doing well and we want to continue to work on, as well as the areas we want to improve. And I think that was the last official slide um, of the presentation. So I think at this time, I'd love to open it up for questions. It'd be great for us to flip through um, if we have time to the um, environmental justice part, so we can talk specifically about um, some of the work that you guys have been doing um, and just answer questions. So that's it. Let me get um, let me get one of these packets. So first, first of all, questions, comments, thoughts. How far in the process are you? Yes, so we, like I said, we've done a 500,000 foot level for the whole entire system. So we sort of know, at least the first cut, everything that we want to collect. So now I have interns focusing on individual goal areas. So for example, if you go to page, um, page 15 of the um, Star Community's general guide, this gives you the highest level overview. So this is the, the matrix. So right now, economy and jobs, we've done a lot of data collection. We had some interns over the summer focusing there. And a lot of that information about what we actually need to submit is already in spreadsheets and has been saved. We have interns right now that are focusing on natural systems and on climate and energy, going back to each outcome and action, following up on writing the description of the program or project, doing the additional outreach to either internal departments or external community partners. Um, there are several things in, in health and safety um, that are very um, resource intensive on the you know, police and fire side, and so we've already sent data requests to them, and they're working through that. There are also a lot of these items that require GIS mapping, so ge geographical information system mapping, to show proximity of parks and community resources to housing, um, the density, all sorts of calculations. So we're working with the GIS department to do a whole litany of maps across the whole spectrum. So that's something that's been in process. Um, we have, as you probably know, our um, Jeff Corey, our pro, um, cultural arts um, folk, folks over at um, Noise are sort of starting to work. There's a lot of different arts groups, and so we're going to be working with him to sort of coordinate with all the arts groups to collect information on there. And then once we get students, you know, the person who's sort of leading up natural systems sort of gets everything that they need, then we'll go on to a next school area. So I would say there are definitely more than a handful of um, actions and outcomes across the whole thing that are totally done with everything that we need. It's got like a yellow tab on the spreadsheet. And then there's still lots where we know that we need to get good descriptions and good data from external partners. The goal of the interns is to try to make it as easy as possible and do as much as they can with the, if you have an organization website and your website's really great, it can pull all the description about what your project's about and put it in there and then you can look that over and provide the number of people that have come to the meetings and maybe any budget that was spent. So to try to use the folks that are very short on time and are really busy to provide information that is most needed from them and then use other volunteers and interns to collect and summarize things that is more publicly available. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we can continue to power through and get everything done by the end of the year, but once we start the ball in motion and we're working with people who have information they want to submit, we'll definitely not it was as late as we can, you know, into March, not be submitting without making sure that everything that we want to include is included. So compared to there, I think there's at least one community that's already submitted their application, so we're far from that. But because we did this really high level first and then deeper dive, I feel really confident about at least knowing all the things we need to track down because we've really done a comprehensive look. And so now it's just a matter of following through with the details. It's the hard part, especially if you um, are focused on one area, is knowing across the whole community what all the different things we're doing. So at least having a sense 
maybe not every project under the sun, but we at least have um, a good idea of one or two things that we can mention in all the areas that we think we can go for. Other questions? Thoughts, comments? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I think it's incredible what you guys are doing. I think it's really important. And uh, I was curious, though, as to what, like you're using a matrix here to, to generate your rating. How did you, when you said that you thought creative industries should be 5% of all business sales, like how did, I mean, that's fascinating. How did you derive that number? So the STAR communities team, the over 200 experts and both local government and professional organizations, those are the folks that spent like three and a half, four years developing the community framework. So I don't, I don't have the answer to that okay. question, yeah. but I do know that each of the goal areas had experts in those fields. And so one of the great things about being part of the pilot and if you, any community that is part of the program that um, has more access to the, the experts, when I'm going through this process, if I'm saying, okay, well you say that you, 5% um, for creative industries, well what does the creative industry mean? Um, right. are the, th this is kind of how we calculate our data to will discount. There is actually a second guide, it's called the technical document. This is 70 pages, the technical document is like 300 pages. So for every single action and outcome, it answers some of those questions. But the questions that we don't have answers to in the technical guide, that's when we can go to our star liaisons and say, so we're working in this area, we're trying to understand what the intention is here. Sometimes there's, even though there were national, involved in national experts, there could be something that is maybe more jurisdictional specific. So under, um, let's see, equitable service and access, there's a, um, an action in there about allowing community members access to services without requiring identification. And I believe that this is related to parts of the country where there's a lot of issues around IDing people and having documentation. And so while in, in our community it might resonate and mean one thing, it actually could be a completely different thing in another part of the country. And so that's where we can ask the really detailed probing question to find out what's the intention of this item? Is there something that we're doing that meets the intention? Is it something that's not an issue for us to try to get to that really fine level of detail? But there were experts in each of the areas that helped to guide the best practices and the measurable outcomes to figure out what those thresholds should right. be. So right. I don't know what that one is. If you're really interested, we can find out. That's right. the, yeah, that's your example. Well, my next question then, how would one access the technical guide? I mean, that'd be fascinating. To so, absolutely. So if you participate in, um, so there's, def there's different levels of participating. If you are interested in just um, looking at this general guide and using the, go the goals to figure out how they might compare to your strategic planning process or what type of, um, of best practices you may want to be incorporating, you can use this. This is like the free guide. Anybody can have this. Right. Um, I'm, there's a whole framework of people that are doing the reporting and can maintain the website. So if you want to, the technical guide, you can either buy the technical guide standalone or a community could become, I think it's a reporting community, where you pay a small fee to have access to the online tool and you get the technical guide. Right. Um, as a pilot community, you know, the city of Evanston, we have a copy of the technical guide. And if anyone is interested in like, learning more, then I'm happy to meet with folks and we can go over it in a lot of detail. But since it's a, um, a, a, a value of being part of the pilot, it's not something that like I could print 500 copies of and hand it out. That probably would not be in right. accordance with the fine point. Um, but communities that are thinking about, even if they're not ready to submit, they can um, participate in STAR and pay sort of a small fee to just have access to the online tool and the technical guide. And then when they're ready to actually do the submittal for reporting, they can then upgrade to the actual reporting. Because someone has to go through all this information and, and verify it. And there has to be some, um, even it's a modest fee, but there has to be some fees associated. Right. And a lot of that stuff is available on starcommunities.org um, for folks that are interested. You had talked yeah. a little bit about business retention and development, and you talked about creating jobs for um, local and um, local uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. In a suburban area like this, an employer may create a job right. in Evanston, but right. it may be filled by someone that comes out of the city of Chicago. Right. Is, is, are, are job creations meant to be uh, solely in the proprietary um, arena of the community that's applying to STAR so they would have right. to 
make sure that their residents are ending up as a preferential hire? Or? Well, I think the first part of your question, can, is there the ability to just get recognition for the fact that your businesses are expanding and hiring people? Absolutely. So only part of this is um, related to the actual hiring of your own employees. So just business, increasing the number of businesses and increasing the sale of the businesses, those two things are independent of where new employees might come from. But there is additional credit given for communities whose businesses are hiring local people in the community. So yes, there's, there's credit for both. Um, there are some communities, you know, Evanston has the um, minority women in Evanston-based business um, program that encourages contracting and requires a certain percentage of contracts to go to those businesses, as well as um, a local employment program that also requires a certain amount of the actual contract work that the city bids to go to local residents. So I think it, you're seeing a potentially seeing a trend here that we want to make sure that we have you know accessible and fair and affordable housing. But we also need to make sure we have jobs for those people. Um, over time, I think if all um, that there are definitely going to be cases where if you're a more bedroom community, you don't have a lot of employment in your own community, then this isn't going to be necessarily an area that you might focus a lot on, but there might be other areas that you're doing more work in because that's a little bit more relevant. So STAR is a, a menu-based system, although there's point thresholds to get the three-star, four-star, five-star. You can do any which combination. You probably could not get, I have to do the numbers, you probably couldn't get a three or four star rating and completely you know, ignore two or three of the goal areas, but you can get them in lots of different combinations. And if you achieve the outcomes, the numeric outcomes, they would give much more points than you do a lot more actions to get you know, equal amount of points. So if you were doing you know, outcome one and outcome two for the business area that didn't include employment for your local residents, you would still be receiving a lot of points. So um, it's kind of a, depending on the, the characteristics. I, I was just concerned about the the, the opportunity that it would create barriers. Right. That if, as an example, the city of Chicago decided to do this and they wanted to put preferential hiring for the city of Chicago, that means that residents that live in Evanston right. would become second class applicants to sure. for, for that job and vice versa. Sure. The city um, resident would be a second class applicant for us and in a community that probably the, the residents are employed outside of the sure. corporate limits, that's, that could create some um, sure. some barriers for a full employment. Sure. If all of the communities in, in, in the in, in the region were trying to compete for the full four star ranking, but it sounds like you can work your way around it. Part of that goes back to, you can also use county data versus municipal data. And, that's right. And if the county's growing in general, then the, then the municipality benefits from that. And I think in this particular area, um, the, it's under business retention and development, but the employment, you know, decreasing the, un, the unemployment of your residents over time, that could be regardless of where they are employed. So the goal, the outcome, and some of the actions that are listed are related to just decreasing unemployment, not necessarily requiring an increase of a, only increase of employment from just the businesses in your local jurisdiction. So that's why really it's kind of like a patchwork quilt. There's a lot of different little pieces all over the place that when you put it all together, it kind of paint the, the mosaic. When you get into real specific detail, it's asking for something that um, is very granular, but you need to we kind of stitch them all together to make the picture. Other questions? I think we could go to um, the environmental justice, because I would love to just call out um, one of the things that is great about being part of the pilot is that all of those 30 communities have had the opportunity to get a lot of feedback. And in all of STAR, there are the opportunity to basically work on pursuing any individual outcome or any individual action. Sometimes there's an outcome or action that's referenced in another area, so you can sort of use it in two places. But there's only one place in the whole part of the system where you actually have to do a, a preliminary step in order to be eligible for lots of other things in that objective, and that's actually an environmental justice. So I'll read it to you. Um, so the purpose of environmental justice is to reduce polluted and toxic environments, with an emphasis on alleviating disproportionate health hazards in areas where low-income residents and persons of color live. And the preliminary step was supposed to be identify the community's prioritized environmental justice sites for evaluating in this objective. And the, the feedback from the pilot was that you could spend a multi-year process just identifying environmental justice sites in your community. And many communities said, hey, we're doing a lot of great stuff in this area, 
but we didn't sit down and like make a planning process. We just started focusing on an area or areas that we felt concerned about. So the, during the pilot process, a lot of community feedback has been given, and because this was the only preliminary step, one then would sort of look at the rest of the things and say, well, can we not even apply for any of these actions or outcomes because we didn't do this broader planning step, which could take a very long time. So the, 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 all these lots of different feedback similar to this went then to the technical review group and to the steering committee. And so the actual feedback is going to be that there is, um, it's you know, it, uh, suggested to do the planning step of looking at your whole community and identifying sites, but you can still pursue out the outcome one and the actions in environmental justice, even if you haven't done a community-wide what are all the sites we should focus on and then picking one. Which is great news for us because the work that you guys have been doing at the transfer site, I would have first read this and thought, well, did we really sit down and do a big plan and we identify 10 sites and pick this as the first one? And if we didn't feel that we did that right process, would we have felt comfortable pursuing the rest of this area? And so now I can look back at this and say, oh, well, okay, let's just look at the individual things we've been doing and see how we can get recognition. So I would love to, on a separate opportunity, meet with you folks to talk about the different things that have been, um, been done and how they compare to the different actions so we can get those things written up. So I think there's actually a whole bunch of points that we can probably get um, in this area that if we had to do a larger, longer um, term planning process, we might have said, well, the things we're doing are really great, but we didn't do the, this preliminary step. So that's an example of where the um, the pilot communities had a lot good opportunity to sort of work through the system and then provide feedback. So I'm not sure if any of you guys have had a chance to look at this yet, but we can um, meet and talk about it. Um, we in want to tell local actions in, the, in that respective area. Again, it's on page 51. 51. Um, it talks about establishing um, or adopting environmental justice plan aimed at reducing polluted and toxic environments in the jurisdiction. Right. Swank offers through um, uh, its, to its members uh, programs for the collection of, of hazardous materials at the household. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, mercury, uh, CFLs, fluorescent light bulbs, sharps, uh, medicines, and, and one would think that that's a potential area where your waste hauling uh, in, in um, mm -hmm. contract might not have fit into this matrix right. under environmental justice, mm -hmm. where in fact what they're talking about is to improve the environment of, uh, of the community. Right. And when we remove those those right. those toxic elements out of the community through that program, there's an opportunity there to at least show some demonstration that you're working collaboratively. I know that in Evanston, they collect those things here right. at Bill Hall, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, and any resident that lives in a single family home or a multi family home can bring them in right. on the drop off respectively and, and generate some positive for that particular component. Yeah, no, that's, and that's a great different perspective than, and that's why we're, every, anyone that reads any different area can then look at it through the, through the lens of the things they're working on and sort of see how they're connected. So the more folks that we get, you know, kind of exposed to these different things and making suggestions. Um, I think is absolutely um, it is absolutely correct. That's a great that's a great comment. Um, so we're going to be working on um, collecting all sorts of additional details on the things that we're doing. Um, I don't know. Any questions you guys have on this? I have a comment. Yeah. Um, I I I guess I'm um, a little bit confused. About okay. This meeting. Sure. I really thought this this is more of an information gathering. Um, type session, right? I thought you were going to provide us with ideas about, uh, or give some type of ideas about how you could help us to do what we're doing in the community. So if there's, if when we submit this information, you submit this information, mm -hmm. you see that there's a deficiency someplace, will someone help to, sure. um, help that organization to improve or? Yeah, so, so phase one really, I would call is sort of the benchmarking. What are the things that we're already doing? Um, how are those things moving along? How do they compare? You know, there's some best practices listed. There's some measurable results that this system is asking us to report on. So we have, phase one is really like, let's collect and see how we're doing. And then there's a whole separate phase two where we'll have to step back and say exactly what you're saying. For each of the individual areas, what are we doing? so far that it seems to be a strength, where there's some areas that um, 
we haven't either either gotten to or have been an interest. Like I think in terms of um, looking at like some of these specific things, we're talking about okay, well at this particular site or are there other sites that we should be focusing on? What can we be doing? So a next phase, yes, would be to be looking at the things that, that haven't been done yet that we want to start working on, and then I would think come up with an action plan for what we can do next. But the phase one is definitely about just understanding what we're currently doing because it's easy for folks to say, oh, well, you know, XYZ community needs to be focusing on more access to local food and community gardening. But if that person doesn't know what's already going on in the community, it's easy to sort of point the finger and say, you should do XYZ. So this is really our internal, let's all get together and figure out and share what we're all doing, and then the next phase would be coming up with a plan. Um, my role really is to help collect all the information, and then once it's collected, then help facilitate what type of process we would do to see what next things we want, we want to work on. But definitely would not be me looking at anybody's data necessarily and saying, well, I think you know this organization needs to do this and this organization needs to do this. It would really be, okay, let's come together. Anyone that was involved in or interested in this particular part of, of what's in the STAR framework and what we want to do moving forward and have a dialogue and, and, and community engagement about that. My job is really just to help kind of the exchange of information and connect um, and get help get the organizations and the community recognition for what we're doing. So I apologize if the um, what the meeting was about was not super clear. No, no, I'm, I, I guess I misunderstood. No, it's okay. So in collecting the data mm -hmm. in phase one yeah. and having somebody review it, mm -hmm. who's reviewing it? Other city people or experts involved with creating the whole start program? Yes. So the information that the city is submitting into the STAR community's rating system will be reviewed by the STAR community's team. And then will, let's say, in the environmental justice mm -hmm. area, it becomes clear, just as an example, that the city of Evanston may want to take some further action. Right. And you come back right. to a nonprofit working in that area. Right. Who's coming back? Is it the city or is it the star experts? No, it'll be it'll be the city. The okay. star is gonna be we're gonna basically sort of submit all this information into the online tool. Their people are going to pretty much read and look at all the information we've submitted. If we've written a description about a program and we provide a link to their website and they click on the link and yeah, this is an organization and they said they had these events and this is how many people came, then they say, okay, they, they submitted what was required. They're not going to then independently call your organization up and interview you or call someone else in a, in a third party. It's really verifying what you've submitted is what was asked for and that the links or things like you know, a copy of a, an article that was in the paper verifies that you were doing that initiative, but it's not sort of that second level of, um, you know, like a background check. This is more, if you've done the work to put this information together and you community have said, yes, these groups were working on this stuff together, then to the extent that they can go to the link or look at the document you uploaded and it looks like a real document, then that is the, the verification. Well, I guess what I'm asking, thank you, that is, is that helpful? That's helpful, but I guess what I'm also asking is if you need um, outside help, sure. Do you, as a nonprofit mm -hmm. or as an individual mm -hmm. company, because you participated mm -hmm. along with the city, do you have mm -hmm. access to any of these experts? Sure. Um, I don't know, so I will find out about that. What I can say is that I believe that because we're going through this very comprehensive look at all the things that we're doing and reporting through this process, that let's say even though there's 15 points available and we've done some great work, we think there's still lots of things on here we always want to improve anyway. We could then say we've evaluated how we're doing in this area and that this could be the way that we could then apply for grants, apply for technical assistance, and look to different foundations because we've went through the process of evaluating and reporting on what we're doing. So this, I think, will be a, a future mechanism to help us access, access um, funds. We definitely have, I mean, I definitely have the ability to find out who the technical experts are in environmental justice. The process that we're doing, though, doesn't um, sort of fund them to like, come here and do work with us. But because we're doing the process of collecting all this data and sort of like a self-assessment, a lot of times that's one of the first things that different foundations and organizations that ask, well, have you done an assessment? Have you done a plan? Uh, five years from now, people may be saying, have you done a STAR community's rating system and how, how did you score in this area? Or how, you know, what were the areas that you reflected upon and our priorities for the city to do in the next phase? So I think this kind of benchmark of how we're doing will help. 
And part of the reason why I love this process is because it's connecting me and other folks to all sorts of different groups that are doing things and being able to help say, okay, well, here's some new ways to maybe be thinking about some of the work we've been doing. And maybe if there's some specific actions on here that we would like to do, that then we can apply for different funding, different resources to say, we evaluated our, you know, what we're doing through this framework. We've identified these best practices we want to pursue next and then go and figure out who can help us with the star folks could potentially help connect us to experts and then we could figure out how to connect ourselves to, to fundraising. So it's a little bit um, maybe a pre-step from exactly what you were envisioning, but I think this is an important step that will help us along the lines. Did you mean to do this um, annually or how does this work going forward? The rating is actually good for three years. So if we want to sort of sustain over time our rating, then every three years we need to sort of resubmit. The good news is almost all of the actions that we're doing, a lot of these are established programs or established policies um, or established partnerships. So the next time we would do this, we would A, just need to figure out if we've done anything new, and B, go back to the existing contacts, contacts to update you know, how many additional meetings you've had, how many programs have been funded, how many you know, miles of bike lane have been put in. But you wouldn't be creating the whole thing from scratch because you basically created this whole framework of what you're doing. And then my also wish over time is that some of the things we're asking to report on now will become easier because we'll create systems that will integrate into this to collect the data in an easier way. Some, if, I'm, if we're asking for something for the very first time that's never been collected now, if we keep collecting it and keeping track of it three years from now when we want to do it again, someone will go, oh yeah, I have that number. They're right here. I've been, the whole time I've been keeping track of those numbers. Um, so I think, especially on the, the outcomes, doing those calculations for the first time, especially if there is an option for county data or local data, but the local data um, wasn't something that we're currently reporting. Like, here's a great example. Um, under, there's a whole item about um, fuel, alternate fuel vehicles. So they want to know how many, how many alternate fuel vehicles are registered to people in your community and the increase in that over time. So that could be like an electric vehicle or another, if we have new inventions, new alternate fuel vehicles. Well, the state of Illinois, only recently started asking or recording whether people were registering vehicles that were electric vehicles or electric hybrid vehicles. So we really don't have, for like the last three or four years, each year how many there were. They can tell me how many there are right now. So when I fill out the star date, it'll be like um, 2013, you know, 25, 2012, zero, 2011, zero. We're just going to say we don't know because the state wasn't recording them. But three or four years from now, they're going to know every single year that's fourth how many vehicles fit into that category. So some of the things are going to become a lot easier because we're going to be continuing to evolve how we're measuring and reporting information. Is this something that the city is taking on at a municipal level along with the board and everything, or is this a pilot just like what STAR is doing as a pilot for you to determine whether or not it will be a good Well, I definitely, I definitely anticipate a full once we submit all of our information and get the rating, that we'll have lots of discussion about how the process went, what was um, what was easy, what was you know took more time, and talk about what the value is for it moving forward. Um, I think right now, because this is a brand, this is brand new, but it hopefully will become the main way to measure sustainability across communities, and that a lot of these indicators will become um, the way that things are being measured. That there will be ongoing value to continue to participate in it, and. Um, there may be some communities that are just hearing about it now, and three years from now, we'll be ready to do it again, and someone will just be doing it for the first time. And so there are gonna be different people onboarding kind of on a continual basis. Um, and so we'll have to sort of see how that goes, but you know, I believe that the, the city has a long standing, standing record in caring about all of these things, and it seems this is the first time that all of these different areas that this, the community's been working on are all being stitched together. So I think we're gonna continue to find value in it, but we're, we've really only committed ourselves to participate in the pilot, get an initial rating, and then we can decide whether we want to keep pursuing it in the future. So it'll definitely be a, a community um, a decision of like the city council. So. Other questions? Just from the, so from the swing folks, the under climate and energy, waste minimization is the last area, and um, this is a good example of, of a goal area, so that should be on page. 34. 34. So, let's see, on page 34, you'll notice, so the 
Waste minimization as a goal is the uh, objective to reduce and reuse material waste products in the community. And the outcome is to demonstrate incremental progress towards achieving 100% reduction of waste uh, by 2050. So it's a pretty, and the that's, idea. That's the goal from all star programs. Yes. yes. That's not an individual goal that Evans can select. No, That's the star goal. this is the star goal. So nationally, star is after all the technical experts. They had lots of people that are in the solid waste management field that said we, as an industry, need to be working to reduce our waste as much as we can to zero waste by 2050. So basically, you take your your current you know waste that you're generating that you're going to the landfill, and you draw a straight line between that date and 2050, and you see each year what your percentage of waste um, diversion should be. So this is a great example where we're going to get a lot of points because we're doing a lot of the actions, a lot of the education outreach, um, uh, having you know various working groups working on different things together, businesses and citizens working together. But the current year, what percentage diversion we would need to have to be on this like straight line trend is a little bit more diversion than we're currently diverting. And so there's definitely a lot of work that we've been doing in this area that's great, but we're going to still need to do more work in order to get credit for the outcomes. So this is very helpful because you know you, you could have lots of different ways to look at what our next waste production goal might be, and now we can say, well, how does this compare to the start trend line? And may, might you imagine you have there's going to be some technology changes over time? It may not really be a straight line. You could see some particular points in time where all of a sudden we're going to solve the um, opportunity of um, organics composting, and all of our food scrap is going to get commercially composted, and that you know. A few years from now, they get solved, and that's a big amount of waste that all of a sudden we're going to see a big, big decrease. But when they evaluate these programs, mm -hmm. there's no appropriate, there's no uh, associated cost benefit analysis done on the evaluation from going from zero to 100 by 2050. No. Um, as an example, there's communities you mentioned, Seattle and Portland, mm -hmm. that look at 100 uh, percent or are approaching 100 percent right. diversion. But they have a monthly garbage fee that's, a, that's approaching $100 a month. Right. You're uh, right. There's, there's, no pro, there, there's no analysis of, as to the cost or benefit relative to that. And in a community like Evanston that's, um, that, that is so, um, that, it, that encompasses a lot of um, uh, economic spectrums within right. the Ev Evanston circle, there'll be those members in the community that says $100 a month is great if I can say that I'm doing this. And there'll be other areas within the community that are going to say, I'm struggling to meet the payment that I'm doing today. Right. And, 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 and that community is going to have to balance that cost benefit. Right. And that's why in a lot of these, there's, there's the outcome, the measurable result that we're trying to achieve. And then there's all the action. So we're going to achieve lots of points and actions. And if we're, for right now, we're able to say we're going to get you know 10 out of 15 or 12 out of 15 points because we only can do actions. And that's... That's why when I you know, showed the five star, there are some communities that might decide we are going to be a we're going to continue to sustain a three star community, and that's what makes you know economic sense for us. And there are other folks that are going to say, well, we want to get recognition for that additional level, which makes sense for us. So that's where separating the measurable results from the actions that you can do, they're separate, and each individual action is also separate because certain ones have different cost um, or staffing implications. So it's very. Um, we'll see over time, and I know that they, especially like in green buildings, for example, when, when they first started the uh, LEED green building program, you know, be the building that was initially through that process, you know, 10 years ago, it seems super arduous. The buildings today that are at a certain LEED level are way more efficient than the same LEED level 10 years ago because so much has advanced. So I sort of see in some ways a similar thing happening here, and then over time, some of these thresholds will change. Um, as well as will be changes in the marketplace that will make maybe we're never going to have a more aggressive goal than 100, you know, to working towards a zero waste, but all of a sudden there could be an advancement that would change it, make it easier. Well, I think with that, we already took um, a lot of your time. I really appreciate you coming, but if anyone wants to chat more, I'll be happy to stay after and look for more emails and follow up from um, our interns because we have a lot of information to collect and um, can't do without all the community partners. So, Thank you thanks so for much. your support. Awesome.